Imam Ali peace be upon him, is not only for Muslims but for all humanity, who are searching for the meaning of life and true wisdom. A brief introduction. Nachiwa Baluha is a collection of sermons, letters, and miscellaneous sayings left as a memorial from Imam Ali, peace be upon him. This book is divided into three sections of sermons, letters, and short sayings. Some of the sayings have been selected from the sermons and letters, the late Sidradi compiled Nachiwa Baluha over a thousand years ago, and before he made the efforts, these jewels were scattered all over the Islamic literature. Other scholars were in the process of doing the same thing, but God gave Sidradi the opportunity and the will to finish this enormous task according to him certain words and expressions of Nachiwa Baluha are matchless in human expression by eloquent writers, Islamic thinkers and even the adversaries of Islam, these people have always accepted that some statements of the Najiwa Baluha are superior to human expression and beyond the ordinary level of the human being's knowledge. We are indebted to the endeavors and initiatives of Sidradi, who left the Najiwa Baluha for us. The sermons included in Najiwa Baluha were expressed and written by Imam Ali peace be upon him, as a teacher and ruler and an Islamologist. Thus, in addition to reflecting the general lines of Islamic thought, these sermons and letters also cover daily matters, that is the current problems and difficulties of Imam Ali life peace be upon him. The importance of the Najiwa Baluha lies in two dimensions. First, it speaks about the fundamental of Islam, such as the matters concerning God, the human being, Islamic views of humanity, prophethood and its position in human history, a means of understanding Islam, and thus necessary for us to study. Secondly, the Najiwa Baluha refers to the social problems of a hypocritical society, with which we deal today. Accordingly, this book can be a source of inspiration for us as regards to the social and political problems of life, and the possible solutions to them. The quality and eloquence of these very magnificent purports needs to be noted. It is these purports which make us appreciate the Najiwa Baluha. Now in this century more than a great scholar of the 4th century did, as a matter of fact, the human being has naturally faced so many hardships in the course of centuries that he or she understands Imam Ali message and the call of Islam from his tongue more easily than those who lived centuries ago. Sermon 1 In this sermon he recalls the creation of earth and sky and the birth of Adam. Praise is due to God, whose worth cannot be described by speakers, whose bounties cannot be counted by calculators, and whose claim to obedience cannot be satisfied by those who attempt to do so, whom the height of intellectual courage cannot appreciate, 
and the divings of understanding cannot reach, he for whose description no limit has been laid down, no eulogy exists, no time is ordained, and no duration is fixed, he brought forth creation through his omnipotence, dispersed winds through his compassion, and made firm the shaking earth with rocks. The foremost in religion is the acknowledgement of him, the perfection of acknowledging him is to testify him, the perfection of testifying him is to believe in his oneness, the perfection of believing in his oneness is to regard him pure and the perfection of his purity is to deny him attributes, because every attribute is a proof that it is different from that to which it is attributed, and everything to which something is attributed is different from the attribute, thus whoever attaches attributes to God recognizes his like and who recognizes his like regards him as two, and who regards him as two recognizes only parts of him and who recognizes only parts of him mistook him and who mistook him points to him and who points to him admitted limitations for him and who admitted limitations for him accounts for him whoever said in what is he held that he is contained and whoever said on what is he held he is not on something else he is a being but not through phenomenon of coming into being he exists but not from non-existence, he is with everything but not in physical nearness, he is different from everything but not in physical separation, he acts but without connotation of movements and instruments, he sees even when there is none to be looked at from among his creation, he is only one such that there is none with whom he may keep company or whom he may miss in his absence. The creation of the universe. He initiated creation most initially and commenced it originally, without undergoing reflection, without making use of any experiment, without innovating any movement, and without experiencing any aspiration of mind. He allotted all things their times, put together their variations, gave them their properties, and determined their features, knowing them before creating them, realizing fully their limits and confines, and appreciating their propensities and intricacies. When the Almighty created the openings of atmosphere, expanse of firmament, and strata of winds, he flowed into it water, whose waves were stormy, and whose surges leapt one over the other, he loaded it on dashing wind, and breaking typhoons, ordered them to shed it back as rain, gave the wind control over the vigor of the rain, and acquainted it with its limitations, the wind blew under it, while water flowed furiously over it, then the almighty created wind, and made its movement sterile, perpetuated its position, intensified its motion, and spread it far and wide, then he ordered the wind to raise up deep waters, and to intensify the waves of the oceans. So the wind churned it like the churning of curd, and pushed it fiercely into the firmament, throwing its front position on the rear, and the stationary on the flowing till its level was raised, and the surface was full of foam. Then the Almighty raised the foam onto the open wind, and vast firmament and made therefrom the seven skies and made the lower one as a stationary surge, and the upper one as protective ceiling, and a high edifice without any pole to support it or nail to hold it together. Then he decorated them with stars, and the light of meteors, and hung in it the shining sun, and the effulgent moon and the revolving sky, moving the ceiling and rotating the firmament. The Creation of the Angels then he created the openings between high skies, and filled them with all classes of his angels. Some of them are in prostration and do not kneel up, others in kneeling position and do not stand up. Some of them are in array and do not leave their position, others are extolling God and do not get tired, the sleep of the eye, or the slip of wit or languor of the body, or the effect of forgetfulness, does not affect them. Among them are those who work, as trusted bearers of his message. 
those who serve as speaking tongues for his prophets, and those who carry to and fro his orders and injunctions, among them are the protectors of his creatures, and guards of the doors of the gardens of paradise, among them are those also whose steps are fixed on earth, but their necks are protruding into the skies, their limbs are stretching out on all sides, their shoulders are in accord with the columns of the divine throne, their eyes are downcast before it, they have spread down their wings under it, and they had rendered between themselves, and all else curtains of honor, and screens of power, they do not think of their creator as an image, do not impute to him attributes of the created, do not confine him with inner modes, and do not point to him with illustrations. Description of the creation of Adam God collected from hard, soft, sweet, and sour earth, clay which he dripped in water, till it became pure, and kneaded it with moisture, till it became gluey, from it he carved an image, with curves, joints, limbs and segments, he solidified it, till it dried up for a fixed time, and a known duration, then he blew into it out of his spirit, whereupon it took the pattern of a human being, with mind that governs him, intelligence which he makes use of, limbs that serve him, organs that change his position, sagacity that differentiates between truth and untruth, tastes and smells, colors and species, he is a mixture of clays of different colors, cohesive materials, divergent contradictories, and differing properties like heat, cold, softness and hardness. Then God asked the angels to fulfill his promise with them and to accomplish the pledge of his injunction to them by acknowledging him through prostration to him and submission to his honored position. So God said, Be prostrate towards Adam, and they prostrated except a bliss. Self-importance withheld him, and vice overcame him, so that he took pride in his own creation, with fire and treated contemptuously the creation of clay, so God allowed him time, in order to let him fully deserve his wrath, and to complete man's test, and to fulfill the promise he had made to Satan, thus, he said, Verily you have been allowed time, till the known day. Thereafter, God inhabited Adam, peace be upon him, in a house where he made his life pleasant, and his stay safe, and he cautioned him of Satan, and his enmity. Then his enemy Satan envied his abiding in paradise, and his contacts with the virtuous, so he changed his conviction into wavering, and determination into weakness. He thus converted his happiness into fear, and his prestige into shame. Then God offered to Adam, peace be upon him, the chance to repent, taught him words of his mercy, promised him return to his paradise, and sent him down to the place of trial and procreation of progeny. God chooses his prophets. From Adam progeny God chose prophets and took their pledge for his revelation and for carrying his message as their trust. In course of time many people perverted God's trust with them and ignored his position and took compeers along with him. Satan turned them away from knowing him and kept them aloof from his worship. Then God sent his messengers, and series of his prophets to them, to encourage them to fulfill the pledges of his creation, to recall to them his bounties, to exhort them by preaching, to unveil before them the hidden virtues of wisdom, and show them the signs of his omnipotence, namely the sky which is raised over them, the earth that is placed beneath them, means of living that sustain them deaths that make them die, ailments that turn them old, 
and incidents that successively betake them, God never allowed his creation to remain without a prophet deputized by him, or a book sent down from him, or a binding argument, or a standing plea. The messengers were such that they did not feel little because of smallness of their number, or of largeness of the number of their falsifiers. Among them was either a predecessor, who would name the one to follow, or the follower who had been introduced by the predecessor. The Prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny. In this way ages passed by, and times rolled on. Fathers passed away, while sons took their places, till God deputized Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny, as his prophet, in fulfillment of his promise, and in completion of his prophethood. His pledge had been taken from the prophets, his traits of character were well reputed, and his birth was honorable. The people of the earth at this time were divided in different parties, their aims were separate, and ways were diverse. They either likened God with his creation, or twisted his names, or turned to else than him, through Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny. God guided them out of wrong, and with his efforts took them out of ignorance. Then God chose for Muhammad, peace be upon him and on his progeny to meet him, selected him for his own nearness, regarded him too dignified to remain in this world, and decided to remove him from this place of trial, so he drew him towards himself with honor. God may shower his blessing on him, and his progeny. The Holy Quran and Sunnah, the Prophet's Holy Deeds. But the Prophet left among you the same which other Prophets left among their peoples, because Prophets do not leave them untended in dark, without a clear path and a standing ensign, namely the book of your Creator clarifying its permissions and prohibitions, its obligations and discretions, its repealing injunctions and the repealed ones, its permissible matters and compulsory ones its particulars and the general ones, its lessons and illustrations, its long and the short ones, its clear and obscure ones, detailing its abbreviations and clarifying its obscurities, in it there are some verses whose knowledge is obligatory, and others whose ignorance of by the people is permissible, it also contains what appears to be obligatory according to the book, but its repeal is signified by the prophet action, sunga, or that which appears compulsory according to the prophet action, but the book allows not following it, or there are others which are obligatory in a given time, but not so after that time. Its prohibitions also differ, some are major regarding which there exists the threat of fire, the hell, and others are minor for which there are prospects of forgiveness. There are also those of which a small portion is also acceptable to God, but they are capable of being expanded. In this very sermon, he spoke about Hajjah. God has made obligatory upon you the pilgrimage, Hajjah, to his sacred house, which is the turning point for the people who go to it as beasts or pigeons go towards spring water, God the glorified, made it a sign of their supplication before his greatness, and their acknowledgement of his dignity, he selected from among his creation, those who on listening to his call responded to it, and testified his word, they stood in the position of his prophets, and resembled his angels who surround the divine throne, maintain all the benefits of performing his worship, and hastening towards his promised forgiveness. God the glorified made it his sacred house, an emblem for Islam, and an object of respect for those who turned to it. He made obligatory its pilgrimage, and laid down its claim for which he held you are responsible to discharge it. Thus God the glorified said, And for God, 
it is incumbent upon mankind, the pilgrimage to the house, for those who can afford to journey thither, and whoever deigneth this verily, God is self-sufficiently independent of the worlds.